did you ever hear of Satanism, the worship of the devil, the evil? Where is it? You will be dead soon if you don't come with me quickly. Approach with the great modern priest of the ancient cult. Where is my wife, Karen, and my daughter? Karen? Well, what do you mean? At night, dark, the rites of Lucifer are celebrated. Where is she? Open the door. Not mistaken, he intends you to play a part in that ritual. Very important part. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Sleezoids, the podcast where we go down the rabbit hole of 20th century genre fare from the most influential canon classics to the trashiest exploitation films we can get our hands on, and invite you to tag along in helping us create a canon of sleaze. Each week is a double feature grindhouse style where we discuss two films loosely related by subject, genre, actor, filmmaker, or franchise, and at the end of each episode, along with our honorary sleezoids, which you can become by subscribing on Patreon, we decide on all the official ratings and rankings for every film that we cover. Patreon subscribers also get an honor shout out and two bonus episodes every single month, which we have been doing for like, God, 10, 11 months. Oh, There's yeah. a lot of episodes waiting for you guys. Hours of content for yeah. you guys. You know, at, at least a solid like 20 to 30 movies that we <laughs> yeah. talked about waiting for you back there. So if you haven't made the jump, consider doing that. And speaking of which, we do have one patron to thank this week. Yeah. Uh, uncool for cats. Six six six. Uncool for cats. Uncool. So he doesn't like cats. Is that what he's got? I don't. Uh, or maybe he's not cool enough for um, them. Maybe okay. he thinks that he's being condescended to by yeah. cats. <laughs> Those bastards. Yeah. But he's also got the six 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 in there to remind us all uh, of Satan. Uh, of Satan. <laughs> which we do. We have a talked a lot about Satan on there this ha- show. There has been a lot of Satan more talk. Satan than I've ever talked about with like person <laughs> yeah, to person. For real. We've discussed it on the show. A lot of devil worship here at the Sleezoids. <laughs> But yeah, that's the plug. Oh no, uh, iTunes, Stitcher, whatever. God, whatever you're listening on, your your podcast listener of choice. Yes. If we're on there, give us a good old rating and review. We if appreciate you've been it. digging the show, it helps us find new listeners uh, and helps us get more support, which we are very thankful for. Uh, but those are your plugs for the week. I'm your host, Josh Lewis, and joining me, as always, is my co-host. Jamie Miller, welcome back. Welcome back to the sleaze. Uh, <laughs> two weeks ago would have been the last time uh, everyone would have heard from us, free listeners, uh, and we would have been doing the big one. Heck of an episode. Two and a half <laughs> hours almost on the yeah. entire Halloween franchise. Did not know. It was, we were thinking like hour 45, you know, two and a half hours, man. We just couldn't stop talking about no, Halloween. No, we, we wouldn't shut the hell up. And <laughs> yeah. event- eventually we had to like be, there were a couple we times. where stop. Yeah, well, yeah, you, you could hear me like stop the conversation and go, we need to move <laughs> on. <laughs> <laughs> we got to move on. <laughs> uh, but in that, we talked about Halloween, the original John Carpenter, 1978. We also talked about Halloween 2, 1981 by uh, Rick Rosenthal and Halloween. Mm-hmm. Halloween 3 season of The Witch by Tommy Lee Wallace. Uh, And then we followed it up um, with a discussion on the David Gordon Green Halloween 2018 with a little bit of conversation on basically, I think we touched every Halloween movie throughout the conversation. We did four, five, six, the Rob Zombie ones. Yeah. Um, So if you haven't heard that episode, that was two weeks ago. It's free. It's just waiting for you back there on your iTunes uh, Lots SoundCloud, of listening Stitcher, wherever you're listening. On that episode. <laughs> uh, but last week would have been the last time patrons would have heard from us, and we would have been talking uh, Dario Argento yeah. with a, uh, a double feature discussion of Suspiria, mm-hmm. 1977, Amazing. with uh, his, the new Suspiria remake out there in theaters for this some month, people right? uh for some people it's already out oh some yeah. people are already watching it uh, the reactions are coming in i've been mostly what sticking do, away from them oh you I don't want to read i don't, okay. don't want to know yet i was wondering if it's mixed if it's positive i'm, I'm going in because we we yeah. programmed it at uh our own theater here in london for i think two or three weeks from now so right. when that comes back out jamie and i will have yeah we're gonna watch the old so suspiria <laughs> followed by the new suspiria back to back so when that great. happens you will definitely hear Jamie and I's reaction to that, probably, whether on the show or whether just online. It'll yeah. be out there. We'll throw it up somewhere. Uh, but we paired it with uh, the sort of uh, thematic sequel uh, in a eventual trilogy that Argento would make with Inferno 1980, mm. uh, which had a very similar sort of nightmarish set piece attitude towards it. Uh, and a lot of similar themes, but done in a more kind of weirdly sprawling kind of way, yeah. which I got a lot of fun out of, but it was a bizarre watch, I will say. Yeah, it was. It, I found it a bit frustrating at times, yeah. but then as it, uh, you know, steered towards the There's end, some imagery it all kind of came film, together. For sure. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a great... <laughs> 
Great film. So if you haven't heard that episode, that's on patreon.com slash Sleezoids podcast, as we've already mentioned. But this week, we've got a special guest for you guys. Uh, we have brought on the host of both the Michael and Us podcast and the Important Cinema Club podcast, where they go through yes. filmographies of filmmakers, which is a podcast I honestly frequently listen to. Uh, we have Will Sloan, a fellow Canadian. Will, how are you doing? Hell yeah, <laughs> I'm very good. Thanks for having me. I didn't know you were a fellow Canuck. <laughs> yeah, Toronto. Just until now. Toronto. Yeah. He, he, in he, my he, home in Toronto as we speak. Nice, yeah, he nice. genuinely asked me. He was like, are we recording this in person? And I was like, I've never had anyone ask me that before. But <laughs> yeah. I was like, I guess I... Because they're always in like Cali or But, but yeah, North well, yeah, I, I'm in something. Toronto a lot. So I guess... Oh, uh, right, right, you know. right. I knew you were Canadian. Mm. I didn't know how Canadian or where... Or <laughs> or where exactly in <laughs> Toronto or the GTA, but I knew there was a Canadian component of this podcast. <laughs> exactly. No, we're, we're in London, Ontario, so we're just about two, an hour and a half, two hours just outside of Toronto, but yeah. sometimes we go watch movies in Toronto because Toronto is where you, uh, you know, you got a film festival, you got the light box there, all kinds Lots of great stuff. There. Lots happened in there. Uh, but Will, what films did you have to talk about on this show and why have you paired them together? Well, the real reason I paired them together was because you asked me to select two horror films that I thought were underseen or underappreciated. And two that came to mind were, first of all, The Black Cat from 1934, directed by Edgar G. Ulmer and starring Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi. And then for a second one, I thought, well, if we're getting really... You know, I want to make these guys work, okay? <laughs> want to see if they're ready to live up to their claim that they are, in fact, sleazoids. Absolutely. So I picked Widow Blue, which is a horror porn comedy from 1970, directed by one Walt Davis. Uh, and aside from just being movies that I like and that I think are underseen, something that I think perhaps unites these movies is that I think they, when you're watching them, they do feel kind of transgressive and they feel mm. kind of unpredictable. They're movies that, you know, 20 minutes into them, you're really not quite sure where they're going to go. And there's <laughs> an excitement about that. Very yeah, true. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I can't get much of a better description than that. But yeah, we definitely yeah. did work this week. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, like it's the, it's the first time I had to go to a porn website for one of our movies. <laughs> May I ask which porn website? I, to be honest, I think it was like a, it had to be like a classic yeah, one. Yeah, it, it was sure. like classic porn Yeah, it had films like a border or something. that said classic, yeah. <laughs> but, but, like, but every like classy. 20 minutes into the movie, it would be like, this is video, is by classic porn, pornfilms.com yeah. or whatever. Yeah. But to well, Will's- I'd just like, I'd like to throw it out there that Widow Blue is available on a, a beautiful DVD that Vinegar Syndrome put out. I, I did hear about that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It has two other films by Walt Davis. So for any folks out there who are looking to do their kind of Walt Davis autorial studies, <laughs> it's a stop shop. That's awesome. The triple Walt yeah. Davis and, and to Will's credit, he did ask for our consent before he just <laughs> before. He's like, you guys want to watch hardcore porn? Yeah, he's like, are you guys okay with that? Like, can I do that? And I was like, dude, you know what? We would not be sleazy if yeah. we didn't. I, I was like, we would lose so much credibility if yeah, I said no exactly. to that one. We'd have but to it would, change the name of the show. It'd be a whole thing. <laughs> we have whole to, thing. you know, we'd have to rebrand as we always talk about pivot to something. Yeah, exactly. It's all good. Uh, but that being said, I think we're going to jump right into it. We're going to jump right into uh, The Black Cat. Let's do it. Did you ever hear of Satanism, the worship of the devil, of evil? I pearls you the great modern priest of the ancient cult. And tonight, dark of the moon, the rites of Lucifer are celebrated. And if I'm not mistaken, he intends you to play a part in that ritual. A very important part. Where is my wife, Karen, and my daughter? Karen? Well, what do you mean? Where is she? And this the movie, The Black Cat, is one that I think is sort of an acknowledged classic for fans of 
either universal horror movies or the filmmaker Edgar G. Ulmer. It's considered a classic, but I mean, I'm selecting it as an underseen horror movie because I don't think it's really that well known outside of sort of horror and, you know, French auteur circles. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I would say I, I've watched a lot of classic horror films and I hadn't heard of it. Mm-hmm. And I, I felt after watching it, I felt pretty embarrassed of having not heard of it because of the thirties horror films that I've investigated. Yeah, it was actually mention, one of the best ones that I've seen. Yeah. Not to mention <laughs> the amount of influence I feel like this had to have had on kind of this whole vibe. Like we've, we were talking about it earlier. We've done so much Satan worship stuff. And like this yeah. kind of had that vibe, uh, Satan near sacrifice the end, you know? ritual right. happening, which you and were I didn't like, know they were doing that in the thirties. <laughs> no, know? there's a lot of stuff that happens in this that I yeah. feel like I used to feel like was transgressive in the sixties. Right. You know, we've talked about movies like spider baby. We've talked about, mm. um, you know, black Sunday. We've talked about, you know, these films from the sixties that we felt were taking these classical film styles from you know, sometimes the twenties through forties and making them feel a bit more transgressive as we pulled into the seventies. Um, and here is a 1934 film doing some of the things that I was crediting sixties filmmakers. Yeah. So it it was, it was a little bit of a history lesson for me to watch this uh, because I was mostly familiar with Karloff and Lugosi through their, their classic films through the actual universal monster films, which I guess they would make, uh, I guess a couple were made before this, but uh, a lot of them would come after this. So this is, I, see, I forgot to look that up. Is it, this is from the same guy that did all the classic monster mm, movies? No. no not exactly. Oh, okay. uh, Bella Lugosi and Boris Karloff were both three years out from making, they had, in 1931, both made Dracula and Frankenstein. Yes. And yes. this was their first collaboration together. And the filmmaker, Edgar G. Elmer, who's a favorite of mine, was somebody who came from, uh, I, I'm forgetting what country he was born in, but he apprenticed in Germany during the great flowering of the German expressionism. Mm-hmm. And Edgar G. Elmer in his interviews would often claim that, oh, I worked side by side with Fritz Lang while he was making Metropolis, or I worked with Murnau, or I did this. I mean, <laughs> we're not quite, he was a bit of a fabulous. We're not quite sure how much he actually did. <laughs> right. But I think that he did work in some capacity on Murnau's Sunrise. Wow. And Speaking he of fled. Which- yeah, <laughs> there's a poster of a sunrise poster on my here. wall right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen that one. Got to do that. There is a heavy Murnau influence in Edgar G. Elmer's films, um, but he, like so many Europeans, fled to the United States. This was his first. No, it was his second feature-length directorial effort. His first one was a movie about venereal disease called. <laughs> So this was definitely going to be a a big break for him. Actually, it was his third. He co-directed a movie in Germany called People on Sunday. But this point is, this was going to be the big break. This was going to turn him into the Murnau of Hollywood, except he had an affair with the wife of the nephew of the studio head. Oh, dude. Oh, dude. Dude, you can't be making the mistakes like that. Dude, watch your own movie. We, <laughs> we know what happens when you prey on the young women. Like, <laughs> yeah. come on. Exactly. Jesus. Now, Edgar Ulmer uh, later married her, Shirley Ulmer, and they were married for the rest of his life. But unfortunately oh. for him, he was blackballed from the studios after that. So yeah. he, he spent 10 years after this making, like, Yiddish musicals, uh, <laughs> Uh, like educational films also about venereal disease until he got employed in Hollywood again, working in poverty row studios, making very low budget movies. And he made low budget movies until he died in the sixties or seventies. And he was sort of rediscovered in the sixties by critics from Cahiers du Cinema who spotted that he had this great, um, Well, he had a distinctive style in his films that against all odds he was able to do despite the impoverished conditions he made them. So he became a hero to sort of auteurist critics. But this movie, The Black Cat, was really his only chance to make a movie at that Hollywood big studio level. Mm. Wow. Um, Mm. Was there anything that came after that you would even put up with uh, The Black Cat? 
Yeah, well, maybe his best movie is called Detour. It's okay. a film okay. noir from the 40s, which he made for a P- Producers Releasing Corporation. And it's one of the best film noirs. I highly recommend that. That's his other masterpiece. But he has a number of other movies that are uh, interesting uh, and and successful to varying degrees, including The Naked Dawn, which is a Western, The Man from Planet X, a sci-fi movie, Beyond the Time Barrier is also quite good, and Ruthless, which is kind of his version of Citizen Kane. Okay. All movies made on very modest budgets. So Edgar G. Elmer is a very fascinating figure to me and someone – worth looking into well yeah this has got to be his biggest one because he had yeah. at the time two of the biggest stars in that system at the time mm-hmm. oh, okay. Be- bella lugosi and boris karloff having launched off the universal what are monsters. they known for is there something that boris karloff uh frankenstein oh okay bella lugosi Damn. dracula Holy so those shit. iconic performances <laughs> yeah. that uh he, they would have just done them i think in 1931 which is the guy that plays dracula is it who that's I'm- that's bella so Bella, oh. Bella would be uh, Doctor oh, gr- Doctor Wordgist or uh, okay. Wordgist. Okay, you can tell him by his Hungarian accent. Yes, yeah. that he could not but hide, which has basically it. made that character iconic with that voice because he yeah. couldn't hide it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Uh, shall we get into the plot of the black yeah, cat? Yeah, we'll jump right. Yeah. We'll jump into the black cat here, which um, kind of picks up with a young couple, uh, Joan and Peter played by David Manners and Julie Bishop, who are traveling to visit. uh, I didn't really pick up on why, but they're traveling to visit uh, a world-renowned Austrian architect, played Mm. by Boris Karloff. Um, uh, I guess his name is Mr. Polzig. And as they travel there, they meet Bela Lugosi's uh, Dr. Vitus Wurdgist, who I guess is also a Hungarian-Austrian man, who uh, was imprisoned uh, in a war camp during World War I, who has kind of made his way back home um, in search of his wife, yes. who he had to leave to go to war. And, and by the way, in this moment, he says one of my favorite lines in the movie where he says, have you ever heard of Kurgal? <laughs> it is in below Omsk. Many men have gone there. You have returned. Yeah. I- Half returned. <laughs> Fifteen years. I half returned. Yeah, he's, it sounds so corny when I say it, and it's a bit <laughs> corny when Bella says it. But there's something about the way he delivers it, and I think this is key to what I like in the Black Cat so much. It's a movie that sort of starts as kitsch. It seems very kitschy, and yet mm. as you get further and further into it, like this is really evil stuff and these are really evil people and yeah. the kitsch kind of curdles into something else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause it starts, you know, we've got dialogue like, like gee, golly gee, I should yeah. love you. Like yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I'm just like, Oh, this is so thirties, you know, yeah. just so, so <laughs> classic. So, uh, you know, tongue in cheek and nice. And then all of a sudden the last half of the movie is just pure Satanistic ritual <laughs> and <laughs> sacrifice. And you're like, and, Holy yeah. shit. What a contrast. And when Bela Lugosi delivers that line, he delivers it in such a way you can really see the pain in his face. Mm-hmm. I mean, as one of his best performances is, that I've seen for sure. Yeah, because um, there's there's a scene in the middle of the film where it's just two close ups cutting back and forth between Bella and Boris that it it kind of actually just blew me away because I had never seen such emotionally clear performance from Bella. Because as much as I like Bella, um, his Dracula films for me are actually. Uh, some of the weakest of the universal monster stuff. Oh, okay. I don't think they're yeah. bad, but like he didn't, there, there is something a lot more emotionally accessible about the Frankenstein character. Who's yeah, an outcast I've heard like that. that. Yeah. And in Bride of Frankenstein in particular, where he's such in such emotional turmoil and in such a kind of like cosmic loneliness almost. Mm-hmm. Um, so to see Bella get a hugely richly dramatic performance like this and to have a filmmaker who could hone in on it and actually get these really devastating close-ups of him, him, like in tears yeah. I, w- I was pretty blown away by that especially because again you don't expect that in a film where you would think that these the performances in feel a little affected a little bit where you feel like you're watching something again kitschy something campy silly something yeah. like that but then there is a real emotional truth and, and undercurrent to this film that comes from also the horror setting that which a real horror setting that you can tell that Ulmer brought with him from Austria where yeah. he, he he ran away from the war 
And this film begins with them heading to an architect's um, house where he has built this new modernist home on top of the burial ground of a World War I fight. Where <laughs> Which some, never some, ends up well. You know, you, you, <laughs> you put a house up on a burial ground, we know what happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, e- e- exactly. There's, you know, he, he built his home on the, what they call the biggest graveyard in the, in the world. Um, yeah. And very early on, it signaled that something is wrong with this place because the driver on their way to the location straight up just crashes fall yeah. crashes right through and there's a brief shot of his head like hanging out through the windshield and it's it's a lot grosser than a 30s horror movie that i've seen too mm-hmm. um including that shot because I, I i haven't seen quite like a a a aftermath shot like that i feel like usually yeah. they kind of cut away Definitely. and and in here there, there's just there's a lot more a lot less averting your eyes um which is just interesting because <laughs> Again, a, there's something, I guess, just kind of stagey and theatrical about a lot of the horror from the period. Yeah. And this yeah. feels like something a little bit more raw, a little bit more expressionistic, which would make sense if he's coming from that. Yeah, I think that. expressionistic is a, is a great word for it, yeah. Well, especially if he's come, you know, I think Will was mentioning that he actually might yeah. have worked on some of those films. Right. Or, or at the very least, liked those films and was inspired by them enough to say that he worked on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> But this was also a film that was released uh, or made and released just shortly before the film industry started really enforcing its production code, which was its censorship body. Mm. So um, a a movie like this, two years later, it wouldn't have had the Satanism. It wouldn't have had the sort of... um, implications of necrophilia or you know some of the other the other transgressions that are in it yeah well i mean this is a a movie that you know you you have the characters you know broadly uh discussing the idea that this is you know this was a, a masterpiece of construction built upon the ruin of a masterpiece of destruction it's very flowery language to describe something horrifying yeah but then and you would think that that would be kind of it that it would be kind of something literary almost but then omar actually starts infecting the imagery with it that there's this they're trying to re- repress almost a horrifying past with this you know this i, I love the architecture of of this house uh, yeah. Where it's it's all it's very minimalist. There's there's lots of glass. It looks like nothing else that we've seen in the movie. Like it like the, seems the, modern. Well, it is, and yeah. the it, and I, it, it's very intentionally so because it's mm-hmm. they're, they're they're trying to paint over. They're trying to cover up the yeah, atrocities the, of the past in a right. sense. They're it trying to move we, on. We don't want this to look like a castle. You know, it's <laughs> it, it's the quote unquote progress that was built on top of literal bodies of people. Yeah. Um, and that that's implied in a lot of the language, but it's, it's another thing when you actually experience it through the filmmaking and you see how there is this sort of weird fakeness to the house. Yeah. Um, that's in direct contrast with a lot of the exteriors we see when we're going there where, and I guess Calmar himself was just playing this. Oh yeah. Trying to just ease everybody into the house, you know, and Uh. get them comfortable until, Satan shows up. <laughs> he, he's got something going on for sure. But the yeah. outside of the house has like, it's 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 muddy. It's got like crosses sticking out of it where clearly makeshift graves have been made. Right. And like it just, you know, there's, there's a big contrast between kind of what you see and what you feel in this film. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of that is just in both the design and the filmmaking. Um, and again, this is stuff that I, I guess didn't think to, that I would see as and early the, as this. Yeah. It's just th- th- like, that this was, this was a very easy watch for me. for me. I was very thrilled from beginning yeah. to end with this. Well, and I mean the 65 minute runtime doesn't hurt either. No, <laughs> <laughs> love that. <laughs> well, the, uh, getting back to the plot just for a bit, the house sure. of course is owned by Halmar who is played by Boris Karloff. And the drama of the film is that Lugosi has come back to confront Karloff because Fifteen years ago, Karloff and, and him were in the same in the same unit in the First World War, and Karloff betrayed the unit. Uh, Lugosi went to a horrible war camp, and while Lugosi was in prison, Karloff ran off with uh, Lugosi's wife and child, and so Lugosi has come back for revenge. Mm-hmm. Um, the wife is dead now; she's being preserved in the basement. Yeah. And the daughter, as it turns out, is now Karloff's wife. And very uh, icky. Yeah. 
That's and as stuff, you mentioned, man. Karloff has built this this incredible kind of Art Deco home on top of this literal burial ground. And there's an amazing scene halfway through the movie, uh, one of my favorite scenes in any movie, I think, where uh, Lugosi has come down to confront Karloff in the basement, you know, in front of in front of the corpse of both their wife. And uh, uh, Lugosi is horribly frightened in this movie by the black cat, you know, the black cat, which is this recurring motif. And for a little while, Ulmer lets his camera just roam around the basement of this house while Beethoven's seventh plays. And Karloff delivers this monologue. uh, You know, I wish I had it memorized, but talking about... Uh, Vita, so you think that you, you, you're coming as some sort of avenging angel? Aren't we both victims of the war? Aren't we both as dead as anyone on that battlefield? Something along those lines. And I don't know, there's something about this scene that just gives me goosebumps. Watching Ulmer's camera sort of roam through this house while this incredibly dark and sad speech is being delivered and this music is being played. Um, uh, I, I mean, it's it's a movie that you come to, as you indicated, you come to it for sort of like horror and for fun. But it's really a movie about how this war just destroyed a whole generation of people. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's it, it's really sad. And you're right that that scene where they they go down below to uh, Karloff's like subterranean lair, where he has just all of these women in glass cases, and uh, one of them is uh, Karen, who was uh, I guess b- both of their wives. Um, and and there, there's almost like he's the same way that he's built this art decor decor house. He's also sort of put them on display as as kind of art pieces, as like a monument to like uh, th- this old world that doesn't exist yeah. anymore. The way that it's even designed, it looks like yeah. as if they're floating, which yes. I found very just kind of uh, kind of unnerving. Eerie. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very much so. <laughs> but it, but and it, Karloff, but, uh, and Karloff is an incredibly sadistic character in this. Uh, he's a, he he gives a very opaque performance and a very sort of wry performance uh, in contrast to, I think, Lugosi's more emotional performance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm sure that part of what I like about the movie, I'm projecting onto it because of what I know about the people who made it, Mm -hmm. you know, knowing that Bella Lugosi was an enormous star for about six months until Boris Karloff came along. Boris Karloff played the Frankenstein monster and basically... From that point on, he was the big star and Lugosi was constantly, you know, trying to get his table scraps and Lugosi managed his career very poorly. And uh, I mean, I know that this isn't actually present in in the text itself, (laughs) myself onto it. But but you think that's happening when they're looking at each other and Lugosi's really sad. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) I just think like it's hard. We all know what's going on between these two guys and it's hard to divorce it. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it also works in the text of the film because Karloff in the film, they're, they're, they're both part of a shared generation that has been yeah. completely destroyed. And whereas Karloff kind of represents its more sort of brutalizing, uh, ambitious side, Lugosi is yeah. the more sort of guilt ridden side of that. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of how both of these types of men were basically behind this destruction. And and how that, each of them are handling it. Yeah, and that's kind of what we get to at the end when we get a final conf- confrontation between the two, which we will get to eventually, um, w- where you do see a kind of Bella Lugosi is like, both of us don't belong in, in a future, basically, like it's over. Yeah. Um, which is something that um, it feels like Karloff was more still trying to force the new world to his to his will and make it into the old world by literally bringing about Satan from his <laughs> book of rights of Lucifer. Um, basically, his his point of view was, oh, all of this death and destruction happened and it ruined my life. Might as well bring Satan into the mix. Whereas <laughs> Bella Lugosi was like, shit, I'm just going to burn out all of us down and hopefully the kids have a chance. Yeah. Those were kind of the two different mentalities that they <laughs> yeah. took towards those, World War One. So that's what that young couple is. They are this sort of pure thing, this, this rebirth in the film mm-hmm. that... Karloff and the Go- Lugosi are literally playing chess over their fate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what the main dramatic crux of the film ends up being, is just two visions of what the future looks like. 
um, based on the horrors of the past. Yeah. Um, and it's a very dramatically rich thing performed by two actors in their prime. So it's kind of like it, yeah. it's very compelling to watch. Um, uh, t- two other things I want to raise. I learned today just just uh, revisiting the Wikipedia page of the film that this was one of the first movies or an early example, at least, of a movie that had an almost continuous musical score. Um, uh, and, yeah, and a lot of the score comes from famous pieces of classical music, including Beethoven and Chopin. And I think I, did, I hadn't quite put my finger on it, but I think that has a lot to do with why it has this propulsive quality i feel like the minute you get to karloff's house there's this sinking feeling that sets in that something really bad is going to happen karloff and the ghosts have this icy cordiality towards each other but there's this feeling like something bad is going to happen and we don't quite know what it is and the the way the music operates in this film is is very sneakily manipulate manipulates your emotions Another thing that I want to raise is the black mass scene at the end, which is yes. unbelievable. Yeah, we might as well just get to the climax in general, I think. Yeah, yeah, I'm down. Which is a which is a big satanic sacrifice in the catacombs, which is even seemingly further subterranean than the layer of glass displays of creepy women. Right. Uh, now this is when like Peter, the uh, the the lead guy, he's starting to really suspect things and the phones are dead they're saying even the phones are dead which is a great line i i really right. enjoy yeah it. that he's was like a, that smiling was as line. he's doing it yeah, yeah while they're playing chess yeah, yeah yeah and then peter gets knocked the shit out right, uh, right, right, right. by the guard by the bodyguard right. yeah and then joan is freaking out because she's just like wow that was bella lugosi's bodyguard that did that i thought bella lugosi was the was good the, guy yeah uh, <laughs> helping us out here yeah and bella's just like i'm just going along with his plan so i can see what it is and find my wife and then maybe we'll figure it out from there but i'm just i'm just playing i'm yeah. playing <laughs> yeah he's playing chess <laughs> but ultimately karloff's plan is to sacrifice joan to satan now i watched the film and i didn't necessarily pick up on exactly why was he trying to like just unleash satan or was he trying to bring back karen to life or was that's what i thought it was I don't know. Do you do you know, Will, why he was sacrificing Joan to Satan, or, or to it life. was just symbolic? He's going to sacrifice the children to maintain the the so, world, the current world right, that he wants. Right, right. God, I have to admit, I just assumed that he was just uh, a, a regular old uh, Satanist that he just <laughs> loved, loved the the demon and wanted to express his feelings towards him. Okay. But but possibly I missed a, um, a key plot detail there. <laughs> <laughs> That's all good. It doesn't really end up mattering. Yeah. What what matters is that he he has chosen a satanic horror world, hell world, literally, over um, you know a, a normal a, life. <laughs> A future where two lovebirds, one being a trashy mystery writer, can just, you know, live freely. Yeah. (laughs) He's like, no, I got to sacrifice their blood so that I can maintain this creepy ass uh, relationship I have with my my old friend's daughter and his dead wife, who I just keep on display in the (laughs) house. And like there's something sick and twisted happening. And he's like, I want to maintain that by sacrificing the children. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's what we get to in the in the big uh, climactic catacomb uh, sequence where uh, eventually Bella Lugosi, because he finds he ends up being revealed that um, it's seemingly he he killed the wife possibly and now that he's married to the daughter and i think he kills the daughter too so bella lugosi is like okay well everything i came here doesn't exist anymore it's been taken from me by karloff so it's time to take it all down so yeah it's time for me to just flay him alive on camera (laughs) yeah something else that probably would not have been in a movie two years after this no i was shocked yeah when, 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 when he, go, when he goes over to the tools and he's selecting exactly which one and you're yeah, I'm like, am I watching uh, hostile right now? Yeah. Like what's going on? <laughs> yeah. It got, it got real, real dark. And I mean, we were, we were praising black Sunday with Mario Bava for doing yeah. stuff like that, taking this sort of like black and white thirties, uh, classical really horror style and making and it gross. And, and I was like, here it is in 1934. Yeah. That's still a wet shot. It's just, it's just bone chilling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And well, I mean, you I mean, folks are interested in some more horror movies from this 
early 30s era that have this um, transgressive quality to them. I would also recommend another Bela Lugosi movie, Murders of the Rue Morgue. And in particular, I would recommend the movie Freaks. I don't know if you've seen Freaks. Uh, I love love Freaks. Freaks. We've been trying to do Freaks on the show for a while. That was going to be the one we did when we were going to do our own 30s one. (laughs) That's probably like the only... Well, other than this one now, 30s horror movie I've seen, and I'm I'm in love with Freaks. I, I love it to death. Mm-hmm. I, I just saw it again recently. It's it's amazing. And what I forgot about yeah. it until I saw it recently was it only kind of turns into a horror movie in the last 10 minutes. Yeah, until really. Until like fun slice of life comedy drama hanging out with a bunch of freaks. But then once somebody betrays the freaks, Ooh. then it turns into a horror movie. Then they're all together. That scene yeah. where they're crawling to, to the per- – <laughs> we won't get into it too much. But, I, yeah, I'm going to start reviewing Freaks now. <laughs> Good Lord. But, you know, watching Black Cat, uh, I mean, there's it's kind of bittersweet in a way that Edgar G. Elmer didn't get to continue with this level of resources. But I know that for for those of us who, who love Edgar G. Elmer and find him interesting – a lot of the meaning of his career came down to the fact that he was able to impose some sort of a personal vision on his movies, despite working in such unpromising circumstances. Yeah. So, um, well, I mean, it is a gorgeous movie. The shadow work, a lot of the cutting again, yeah. that, that sequence where the monologue takes place downside in the, uh, down in the subterranean layer. And you get the reverse ups of the two guys who are acting their ass off. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, you get this wide shot where you see the girl floating in the, the glass display. And then the shadow of the yeah. cat comes into the uh into the background behind bella Mm -hmm. startles the shit out of them and like again just those three shots and their construction and how it it felt like i was watching a modern movie oh yeah which is i love the shot of it's kind of angled in a weird uh kind of a diagonal Mm -hmm. angle and and it's just the spiral staircase going down and it just gives such that whole vibe where it's just the staircase and the and the long hallway it just makes you think that the, he's got this, like the subterranean layer yeah. is huge. Yeah. Like they just give such a good scale to the, to everything. And even movie. when they go outside and you can see the, 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 the trees blowing and the yeah. mountains in the background and so the, detailed. There, there's something huge happening mm-hmm. here. And I, again, for such a, you know, having, uh, you know, not necessarily the resources that, you know, he, later filmmakers would get um, and that this would be the most that he would ever get. He makes real, real great use of it with the expressionistic filmmaking that he uh, so clearly loved. Um, but I think we might enter the reductive rating round on this one. Uh, Will, for you, this is the part of the show where we remove all the words, all the nuance, and we reduce the film between a number between one and five for our own bookkeeping purposes on our on, on, on our lists. Um but also, if you have any final statements to make about the film, you can do that in this part. And as always, because I'm an asshole, I'm going to go first. Uh, <laughs> and for me, this was a five. Um, I was, I mean, not necessarily shocked. Shocked I hadn't heard of it. Because mm-hmm. while I was yeah. watching it, I was like, this is one of the best uh, American 30s horror films that I've ever seen. Uh, or I guess maybe studio. This might be British, I guess. Was it? Was it American or British? It, it's an American film. American oh, okay. film. But all these universal horror movies of the 30s are always full of people with British accents. Yeah, I don't that know part always that freaks me out. <laughs> but it looked highbrow. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, basically everything we, we've talked about so far, I was just surprised at, at, at just how gorgeous a film it was and how... Um, the, the the real world horror implications are captured in the filmmaking and how dramatically engaged it is both with its ideas of of a sort of uh, an older generation dealing with the, uh, the you know the the horrors of war and how that has found itself manifested in sort of the the current day progress that people are trying to make and that they're still living in it that's the main thing I guess is that these two these two guys who have seen all this are you know, still active participants in what the future is going to look like and how both of them can't seem to handle that. Bella Lugosi as, as a more guilt ridden, um, a, a, a more de- sad and devastated version of that Karloff yeah. as a straight psychopath. Let's, let's just bring everyone into our hell world with us. Yeah. And then to see these two stars both act the shit out of that, um, and get you emotionally engaged with that story and then have a final confrontation that is just completely brutal like it, like it is, 
it, it, it does heighten the horror to have that emotional undercurrent to it that these actors bring. And it is the best performance that I've seen from Bella Lugosi, who, uh, as Will mentioned, kind of had a bit of an unfortunate career later. I mean, yeah. he, he ended up making uh, Ed Wood films. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, because he he couldn't he find just work, couldn't get he other couldn't. Stuff. Yeah, and I mean, uh, and Wood must have been like pumped to get like a skilled, oh, <laughs> a he really was, skilled actor. He, he and was be psyched. Like, yes, and it's not to say that uh, you know, I there are some things that I haven't seen of Bella Lugosi that you know maybe would be worth visiting, but I I have never seen him as emotionally powerful as he is in this film. Because I will say for Bella, uh, in if you watch his Ed Wood movies like Bride of the Monster, man, he really brings it. Like, yeah. He, he just, you know, in his career, he just made total dog shit. And yet <laughs> in, in every movie he tries, uh, you just got to respect a guy for that. Hell yeah. Uh, lo- yeah. We, we, we respect Bella Lugosi in this podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's how it goes. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's it for me. So uh, for you, Will? Uh, yeah, I give it a five. I think you summed it up uh, very beautifully. I think, yeah, it's a movie where the past is present and a movie of unspeakable horrors and evils. And also, uh, again, you know, 63 minutes can't lose. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm right now. I feel bad. I always feel bad if I am the the one guy that does this, but, uh, (laughs) um, I'm going to give it a four out of five for now. It's a very strong four. Mm. Honestly, it's kind of up there with, uh, um, spider baby. You know how I oh, gave right. that the four out of five. Yeah. Quite honestly, if I went back, it'd probably be a five. I think I just need another rewatch on it. Um, that's what I'll say. Let this movie marinate for you. Yeah. I, I feel like I have like a decade long relationship with this movie. That's right. kind of brought it to the point where I am now. Yeah. Mm. See, and I have, I've had movies like that where I've, you know, just over the years, they kind of became, they loves accumulate. Of right. Yeah. Exactly. So I feel like this one uh, could do that. Cause I was just shocked i had no idea that the 30s ever went down this road <laughs> and uh like the the skinning alive sequence uh was was something i truly did not think i was going to see um the the satanism i did not know they were doing in the 30s no. and like what i also find Occult interesting stuff definitely d- weren't huge after this and really yeah. didn't make a huge comeback until the 60s and 70s. Yeah, one of the most fascinating parts of this whole show for me has been finding things like where they start, you know, like where, where the mm. inspiration is taken from. And every single time, you know, we were watching Black Sunday, we had, you know, we're like, oh, it's the 60s. And then yeah. now we have the 30s. And then like, fuck, we got to go to the, the 20s now. I want to see what they got in store for us. Oh, yeah. so. well, well, for this, we got to go back to actual the actual silent expressionism stuff of, right. the, of the 20s and stuff. Yeah, I guess that'd be like Nosferatu and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Faust. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> That's another devil one, right? Yeah, that, well, I mean, with Faustian bargain with the devil, yep. right? That's the, that's the whole thing. So, yeah, for now, I'm going to give it the four, but I do see this... Uh, uh, becoming the five for sure awesome well that's going to be it for black cat we're going to be right back and we're going to be talking widow blue 1970 <laughs> let's get our porno on <laughs> hey guys uh so i couldn't find a widow blue trailer it's, it's just too crazy too obscure so instead i'm gonna get my boy jackie moon to help us out hit him with something sexy jackie Come on, girl. That's right. Yeah. It's We're getting me, real Jackie. sexy on Sleazoids podcast this week. That's right. Let's get Little sweaty. widow blue Let's get for you. Sweaty. I'm talking rainforest sweaty. Let's get I'm sleazy. Sweaty. Let's fill a bathtub full of sweat. Right. Hit it, Jackie. Widow Blue. That's what I'm talking about. Good stuff. All right. Well, we are back and we are talking Widow Blue 1970, directed by Walt Davis, aka a, Sex Psycho, aka The what Demon was the other one? and Miss Jones. <laughs> yes. And that title was playing off of a then popular porn film called The Devil and Miss Jones. Oh. A little historical insight for you there. Yeah. There we go. The porn history. Well, uh, on the cover, this is referred to as a sexy shocker from the vaults. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's a pornographic horror film. 
uh, part of a genre that uh, a friend of the show and patron of the show, Steve Carlson, because uh, he was shocked when I posted the screen cap of this on Twitter. Oh, he knew about it. He, uh, he was. I'm he, not he, surprised. He, Steve, he was aware. Steve. Steve's Steve been, knows everything. Yeah, right? Steve's like, been like our patron since day shout one. Out to Steve. He is one of the dumpster diving trash legends who yeah. has watched like ten thousand films and like <laughs> is is all about diving in where nobody else will. And even he was shocked because he was like, he, 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 he admires what we're doing, that there's two not sleazy <laughs> people or that weren't maybe when we started who are, who are getting, <laughs> yeah, in, when we started, I'm, I'm knee deep in it now, who are making some of this stuff, you know, maybe accessible to people who don't want to themselves dive in. Yeah. Um, he was like, I really thought it, you guys were going to be another year before you did a hard gore <laughs> film. Porno, yeah. <laughs> And, and he called this it hard for me. I feel like I'm like corrupting influence for this. Podcast. <laughs> yeah, you're bringing it this week. Yeah. Well, for any I, listeners I that, have... be, you know, in an overcoat saying, Hey kid, want to see some- <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what it is. And you got the triple pack with the other Walt Davis specials. Yeah. yeah. Now yeah. It's, it's not an official genre, but Steve did call it the hardcore genre, which okay. is hardcore porn meets uh, gore horror, basically. Yeah, and yeah. that's well, exactly I'm what this film was. Bring this up because I'm picking Window Widow Blue not only because I like the movie, but because I want it to be sort of representative of this whole genre, which I think is still uh, under acknowledged and underappreciated, even in you know kind of serious gore fan circles. Mm. So I'm thinking movies like I'm I'm being pretty easy on you guys by picking Widow Blue because. <laughs> You know, they, they only get worse from here. <laughs> I'll, I'll just Good. give you a rundown of what a bit of the canon might be. Yeah. Uh, you know, hard gore is the most famous one, um, you know, for what that's worth. But then beyond that, there are also movies that are, I don't know if you're familiar with the term roughies, but roughies. I've heard of that, yeah. Okay. Roughies were for soft gore and then hardcore movies, which were very sort of you know, BDSM, uh, very violent, slapping around, frankly, a lot of sexual assault themes. And, uh, you know, a famous example of that would be a movie called Forced Entry, uh, starring Harry <laughs> Reams, oh. and a kind of taxi driver type porn film, or uh, Sex Wish is another one, and uh, The Taming of Rebecca is another one. So these are all films that you can put on your Netflix queue. Absolutely. And watch any day now. Now, those the are all family. Those are much harder stuff than Widow Blue. Widow Blue is a much more kind of joyful movie than those, which is why I thought your audience might appreciate it. Yeah, Um, absolutely. No, I think the closest we've got to this is maybe we did do the one big pinky film. We did uh, Female Prisoner. Oh, yeah. Which was Japanese nudity and violence kind of merged together um, uh, with some pretty horrifying sexual violence. Just without penetration. But just, yes, (laughs) softcore, I guess. Uh, And another reason why I want to do Widow Blue specifically is because it came out in 1970. You know, Deep Throat came out in 1972. And that is commonly thought of as like the birth of the hardcore genre. So this is in the very, very, very early days of, you know, I like it's it's we're talking about a real legal gray area when this movie was being made and shown. It would have mostly been shown in storefront theaters in the sort of California area, you know, Los Angeles, San Francisco and storefront theaters were theaters that had less than 50 seats. So they didn't. So so you could show movies there and they weren't actually like zoned legally as movie theaters. Holy shit. That's crazy. And, and so that's where the early kind of hardcore movies played. And a lot of hardcore movies at this time would have been fake documentaries like, um, like, Oh, uh, here's, here's a survey of pornography from Denmark and we're showing it to you for clinical reasons. Or, you know, here's a, <laughs> here's a very serious film about, how to how to have uh, proper relations in your marriage, and uh, trust me, I'm a doctor. I'm hosting this film. This is very serious stuff. Do you know what? A really funny digression. I just is speaking of uh, just off of the black cat a little bit too. I just uh-huh. watched a movie because I just got this service Canopy where you can use your okay. library card and watch these free movies. Oh yeah, you're uh, And I watched a 1930s movie called uh, I think it was called Maniac. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, I love and, that movie. Yeah, and and it does exactly what you're talking about, where it, it's basically a kind of uh, 
mad scientists, uh, weirdly violent, a tiny bit psychosexual uh, movie where this this actor goes insane trying to play uh, this doctor that he was working with because he murders him and tries to cover it up and then play the doctor. And things get really weird when his patients start coming to him and he's like, I'm not even the doctor, or like, but he's trying to be. Yeah. Um, but that whole movie it's a really gross movie and they couldn't get it made. So what they basically did was they released it as a, a sort of documentary about mental illnesses of the time. Oh so title God. cards will come up and be like, you know, schizophrenia is like this. And then it'll go back to the story where this guy is clearly having like a schizophrenic breakdown. Oh and then it'll be like, this mental illness was like this. And the patient will come up and like, and like, it's the same idea. And what's funny is that that eventually goes into, it's based off the same Edgar Allan Poe, uh, black cat story eventually about these, oh, okay. these guys going insane and kind of burning things down and feeling so much guilt over this destruction and stuff um and it's just funny that yeah a lot of these places they would hide uh their more gross impulses under education at the time to try to <laughs> yeah. get it released <laughs> well, all we're trying to do is bring knowledge to the people <laughs> yeah well another famous example was a movie from the 40s called mom and dad which was a, a movie about teenage pregnancy and it had footage of the actual birth of a baby in it because legally a lot of places that was the only way that you could see frontal female nudity in a movie Uh, (laughs) john waters talks about this a lot and what a formative influence seeing this was for him but like the the guy who made the movie this showman named kroger bab he would take the movie from town to town and he would hire actors to play nurses you know, uh, and, and give out pamphlets at the theater and he would have, you know, uh, in the afternoon it's screenings for women at, in the evening it's screenings for men. And it was all, it was all very educational. Like, like we're giving people the information they need so that they don't become pregnant. <laughs> so, That's I mean, Widow Blue is certainly not an educational film. Uh, oh, well it is in a way, but not, um, <laughs> it's not pedagogical. And, <laughs> No, um, no, if you, if you want to walk us through maybe the main plot, we'll say. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, it, the, the plot is actually more complicated than <laughs> you might think. And yeah. I, it, it's easy to get lost in the first 20 minutes. But uh, to, 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 I guess to put it as simply as possible, there's a character named Nick, and he's married to Elise. But um, oh, it's shit, not you know happy- the names. That's that's awesome. That's, yeah. I, I couldn't track them. <laughs> yeah, mine was like black haired dude, <laughs> brown haired dude, blonde, blonde, blonde lady. Girl. <laughs> yeah. yep. So you got Nick and Elise. They're married. Not a happy marriage. Elise no. is having an affair with a guy. Nick is having an affair with Eva Blue. That's the titular widow blue. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, Eva Blue is married to another guy unhappily. <laughs> named Jerry played by Walt Davis, the filmmaker. That's right. (laughs) He's also banging somebody. (laughs) Jerry is having a gay affair with another guy who is Uh, widow blues brother, right? (laughs) He's having this affair so that, so that he can be killed. And you don't even find that out until after the sex scene. too. (laughs) (laughs) So, okay. This is another reason why I think this movie is so interesting because this is a genuine, honest to goodness, bisexual porn film from 1970. Yeah. Like it has actual hardcore gay sex scenes. And I think it really speaks to the fact that the porn industry was in sort of a wild West era at this point, (laughs) like rules had not been established exactly for what you could put on (laughs) screen. Just get naked. Let's see what happens. (laughs) And like, you know, Walt Davis, as I understand it, was a gay director. Um, and I think it's pretty obvious watching the movie since he does participate in the scene. Yeah. Um, but you can imagine that around this time, it was sort of de rigueur, of course, for porn movies to have a woman on woman scene. And so perhaps certain filmmakers thought, well, if we can have that, why not a guy on guy scene for the girls? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's an experiment that obviously didn't last too long. Yeah, you don't. I don't know if you see that too much uh, in, in the full feature lengths anymore. I don't. I wouldn't <laughs> think so. But uh, so anyway, Eva Blue, Widow Blue's husband, gets killed, and she celebrates by uh, fucking her two accomplices, like you do. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. Well, we we, we got to talk about the thing, okay? Because the, the the thing that was most interesting to me about this because when jamie uh-huh. and i first discussed that we were going to watch this we were like okay is it a porn movie or yeah. is it a horror movie with porn scenes and that right. was just it like like is it is it constructed around the sex scenes 
which it is a tiny bit, but mm. the filmmaking only only I would say in maybe two of the sex scenes does the filmmaking actually reflect a porn scene. Yeah. Yeah. Because because it's not like it's necessarily focusing on the the generals like most porn seems to do. Well, no, because because they're more focusing on like the emotion and like and they're actually having sex, but they're they're more focused on you know their emotions and what's being done. Uh, like uh. for instance, having sex uh, on top of a dead body. Things well, like well, that. Well, that's just it. Is that it? Kind of started out as like like the the porn scenes made sense. Yeah, and, then yeah. There, and there was this kind of yeah. like jazzy music that was going on, and I sure. was like, okay, and that's mostly during the 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 gay sex scene mostly. Right. Yeah. But and then when when they come in and they like basically chop the dude's head off, who's, yeah. who's just you who know just climax, who just climax <laughs> on the bed. Yep. Just, what a way to go! Just had like ten minutes of on screen sex. Yeah. Gets his head chopped off, and then they start having sex next to the corpse. And at one point, uh, Widow Blue even uh, performs fellatio. On, on the, the dead corp, corpse. On the dead corpse. She's like, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, And the guy's like, what the fuck? <laughs> even, what I love is the guy that's having sex with her is even like, you're fucked in the head. Yeah. And then, but after she does, he's like, okay, bro. I mean, we are naked. But it, it's after that first bit of violence that the tone of the, even the porn scenes changes. Like the music is yeah. more ominous yeah and the camera can't help but like wander its way back to the corpse a lot of the time yeah, yeah. um and then that really affects the film when we get into the uh uh the 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 three-way that happens between the two accomplices and the widow right and because like, then you find out it's incestual and you're well, like and but then even then like they start doing these really grotesque close-ups where the the, sure, the, the film yeah. starts to get discolored it starts to go like red and green and it, and it starts cutting between them having sex and shots of the violence right where like right. they're still thinking about it or it's still present even yeah, it's in the, the intercourse that and, and, and i'm gonna with, tell right? you that stuff does not not get you going like if you watch that at a, <laughs> at a porn thing like if you came into this you're like i want to watch a porn film like this yeah. is this is watch your porn film interspliced with gore it's not like they're separate scenes after the violence happens the porn uh, and the sex are actually intercut um, in yeah, ways that are really, really unnerving, <laughs> especially just because, you know, I, I don't know about you, but when I looking at other people's genitalia, I look at them kind of as being incredibly vulnerable. And yeah, so then absolutely. to have, you know, the sort of suddenness of that first act of violence just present all of the time, you're like, something's going to go wrong well, with right. someone's genitalia. I, and and what do you know? Brought, <laughs> right. I'm glad you brought that up because this is one of the things that sort of interests me about the horror porn genre, because there is that vulnerability. Uh, and there's this, there's this, you know, realness, this, this abject quality to it. Like, you, you know, to, to see a penis go into a vagina um, right there, you know, it's real. <laughs> and you're, 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 you're conscious of the, the frailty and the vulnerability of the human body, particularly in some of the rougher examples of this genre, mm -hmm. all of which makes it more unsettling. Yeah, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's also there's something like like what you were saying with uh, how, you know, it's just after, you know, climax and the guy gets his head cut off. And then later we even see a, uh, a penis being literally eaten off. Uh, or horrifying. bit off accidentally. Horrifying. Let me tell you, like my body like shook. I was oh, like, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when you think of, you know, sex, you think of something like you're in a comfortable situation, uh, at least with the person that you're with, you know, that kind of thing. And then to bring such grotesque violence into that factor just, just makes you feel absolutely disgusting because mm -hmm. normally, and especially our generation, we're just used to, it's porn, you know, <laughs> right. you know what porn's for. And, uh, yeah. and this one, it can't be used for that. I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> At least I would argue. Well, or no, you're a very sick person. <laughs> I think. I think that that was just what most but surprised hey, no power me, to you. and what made me enjoy the film was yeah. just that he ve very clearly, the filmmaker actually did have a formal interest in this as a horror film. Yes. Um, yes. And that, yeah, it's super low budget and still centered around these hardcore sex scenes. Yeah. But the sex scenes stopped becoming any kind of enjoyable around yes. the time that the violence enters the picture. Just which because, is pretty early on, too. Which is yeah, so it just it, sets it, it's, the it's tone like maybe the second like, sex scene. And then you start feeling weird because you're like, it's like I'm watching sex, but this is 
I don't want to. The tone isn't <laughs> right. This, it's not. It's just, yeah. it, it's a really gross tone where he, he doesn't let you forget that violence has just happened right. and is still happening almost in this weird way. Again, the, the, the most grotesque scene for me is that three way scene mm. where, especially when it goes where they're they're forgive my language, they're spit roasting the shit out of her uh, <laughs> just, to, just to put an image in your head. That's what's happening in this scene. Uh, and it, there's the wide shot of it where you're kind of like, okay, this is a porn scene, but then it does a close up of her face and it does a close up of the, of the guys. Mm. And again, I don't know what he did to the, film or if it was just bad film and he just went with it but it does get discolored and it's almost yeah. like uh, it, it, the film enters a bit of a feverish haze and then it eventually it kind of reminded me and I, I I can't believe that I'm saying this <laughs> 2001 A Space Odyssey <laughs> <laughs> I get that. I get that. It's sure. just the color changes and he's like yeah. going whoa, through this whoa. crazy moment in his life. A like, little, yeah. little psychedelic horror in there <laughs> exactly. for you. It gets yeah. a little abstract. This is the 2001 Sh- of shot porn. of a giant fetus. Yeah. Just, you know, I also Kubrick like directed this. I also like that this movie has this dream logic to it that mm. is also very unsettling. Yeah. So especially right, by like oh, the end and everything. Well, yes. Yeah, so right after this, you know, widow blue and her accomplices are planning to flee um, but, but, uh, oh, there's a knock at the door and it's their two swinging friends. One of, <laughs> one of them played by John Holmes. That's, he's the guy that they, uh, they base Boogie Nights off of. Oh. Yeah. He's su- super famous old school porn star guy. Very cool. Yeah. Well, for his, uh, uh, 13 inches of talent. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, um, and, and they come in and they're like, oh, well, you know, why don't we just invite ourselves in? And hey, since we're here, uh, why don't we all just have group sex? Oh, I don't, don't want to have group sex. Oh, no, come on. It'll be fun. Let's have group sex. And then so they do that. And then, you know, while His they're having proposition sex, is the best like thing ever, too. Yeah. He's just like, come on, y'all. Let's just get naked. Oh, yeah. some of the some of the bizarre uh, dialogue that occurs because of the way that this the, the porn be, has be, to go. well because of the dream logic too, and because yeah. of how just kind of absurd a lot of this is. Yeah. My my favorite, and some of it I think is also like improvised because they have to do this on the fly. There's very few cuts. Oh yeah. So I think some of it is honestly just role playing uh, well, some of the time, and and some of it is just straight up intentional comedy. Yeah, yeah. My yes. my absolute yeah. favorite joke in the movie is when they finish having sex next to the corpse the one where they just decapitated the gay man yeah and they're they and and the first thing they do is they get up and they're like okay we just we just climaxed there's a corpse here uh we got to take it outside inconspicuously so let's just put it in a coffin. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And the coffin One is... One that's shaped exactly like a cliche. And, and it's too big for the room. There's no way that they got it out. And <laughs> yeah. it's like... And, and and that's just it. Is they're just like, all right, this makes sense. We're, we're trying to hide this body and this murder. Yeah. So we'll just put them in a coffin and I guess walk them out the door, each <laughs> holding an end of a coffin. Yeah. And they can't figure it out. And it becomes a bit of like a comedy of them trying to figure out how to like lift it right. And then they end up having sex on top of it. Yeah. <laughs> they just give up. You're like, fuck it. Let's just have sex. So, so then it's just a mise-en-scene choice where the coffin is just set design. <laughs> yeah, now it's a bed. <laughs> There's also so now they're like, having sex on romantic. top of the body two times in a row. <laughs> How disrespectful. <laughs> There's a great moment in that scene, by the oh, way, when the phone oh, they're man. filming it in somebody's house somewhere and the phone goes off during the scene. And one of the actors just says, oh, forget the phone. We have to get rid of this body. <laughs> and if you pay attention, the phone rings like five times. It's yeah. clearly somebody just called the house and they just <laughs> rolling. Dude, yes, that's exactly what I thought, too. Yeah, because you would think like what you normally do is just like, you, OK, they did the phone thing. They had the dialogue. Stop the phone ringing. But then yeah. it just goes as the dialogue continues. And you're like, yeah. this is a little Film distracting, guys. <laughs> and somehow it works within the aesthetic of the film. Yes. Uh, by the way, I just want to give a shout out to the actress Susan Westcott, who plays Widow Blue. Uh, I think she's quite good in this. <laughs> yeah. 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 Definitely. Absolutely. She, she, it's really unhinged, I think. Uh, yeah, she just I, goes for it. I will say yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know her other work that well, but uh, <laughs> although, believe me, I'll be investigating. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, really impressive 69ing and like, you know, th- <laughs> yeah. things, things of that Sounds nature as well. Like she could do it uh, for sure. Gets uh, the job done. <laughs> I mean, the movie ends as it must. Oh, with, of course. Uh, 
one more double cross. I won't. I won't. I won't spoil all of the details. No, no. no Actually, this is a spoiler show. You're you're welcome to do so. Yeah, this is a full spoiler show because we okay. we believe in analysis through uh, getting into all the details. Yeah, and so feel free. A lot of our listeners sometimes watch along with us. We announce the show, the movies before, so that they can do that. Or a lot of people just you know they don't seem to care. They just take it. Yeah, <laughs> they're like, I should have watched this because it's fifty years old. <laughs> yeah, we haven't done a poll on how many people are actually watching all this stuff with us or just like listening to us talk about yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, we really don't know. But Be- no, feel free to... Because uh, especially with this film, though, I feel like there are a lot of people who maybe are just aren't interested in this kind of film. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Yeah. Well, they should be. I mean, if there's <laughs> one thing people take away from this episode, I hope it's that you should watch Widow Blue and you should like it. Absolutely. But, uh, <laughs> of course, it ends with, um, you know, Nick getting his comeuppance uh, mm-hmm. with his, his penis being bit off. And, uh, and but, the girl chokes on it, right? But yeah, but the, but that's the best detail because <laughs> it's it's actually super hilarious the circumstances because I kind of yeah. figured something like that would happen. I'm like, why yeah, do you yeah. include genitalia in hardcore gore if you're not going <laughs> to cut one off or yeah. like do something yeah. gross with Come it? Come on now. <laughs> but what happens is that I think he's having sex with his wife so that yeah. because he helped kill her husband or the other guy or whatever, and now yeah. now they're going to kill his wife so that they can run off. Right, right. And so she comes in with the butcher knife being like, now it's my turn. And we know how this went the first time where the dude got decapitated. So she's going to go at the girl. She's probably going to decapitate the girl. Yep. But the girl sees her in the corner of her eye, freaks out, and chomps down as hard as she can on the, on the dude's dick who she's sucking at that point in time. And it and y- the makeup effect is actually pretty decent. It's decent, yeah. <laughs> it's not bad. Yeah, it's- I mean. It's just like the a, a short little stub with a yeah. shitload of blood on yeah. it. Yeah, well, well, and and just the imagery of you—you you know that she was shocked and that she put she like shut her mouth basically is yeah. what she did. So you, your mind puts through the editing puts that together, and then she just chokes and dies. Yeah, <laughs> and something the- about the the tone of this scene—it's both incredibly horrifying yeah. and so funny so you don't <laughs> yeah. know how to feel like you really don't. You're just like first you're watching a guy get blown. And then you're watching a girl choke on the guy's dick that she just bit off accidentally. Well, yeah, and and you know that he conspired already to help murder to someone help earlier, this. so you know that this is partially deserved. There's so many <laughs> factors in this in this dick chomping. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it, it it is viscerally effective, which is just surprising again yeah. for a film that you would not anticipate to have the best you know effects. real filmmaking in it yeah uh, necessarily. So again, that was probably the most surprising part for me is that a lot of the gore stuff did work, mm-hmm. and the way that it interacted with the porn stuff was more artful than I anticipated. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, I agree. and uh, you know, with great artistry, Walt Davis leaves pretty much all the threads dangling as he closes the film. There's the the plot does not really get wrapped up, but it continues in the mind of the viewer. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it kind of. It, I'm just like throwing these movies uh, of what these are reminding me of here, but it reminded me of um, Basic Instinct, the ending to that. Oh, where it was right, kind of right. like it's like is anything going on? Oh, there's the ice pick, you yeah. know, and then this one was just <laughs> there's the cleaver. Yeah. Was it a dream? We don't know. Man, it was it was so great to have like, a porno def- have a twist ending and that kind of <laughs> shit. Like it was great. <laughs> <laughs> so funny I'm, I'm still in love with the way that that one guy said let's get into a round robin <laughs> 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 come on y'all <laughs> come on y'all let's get into the round robin <laughs> he's just so what I loved about that scene uh, and there's no like horror in that scene which is kind of odd well no but- there's, a, there's one slight bit at the very very end of that scene where the camera starts kind of losing control suddenly okay. and it starts like swinging around not being able to see them and then it zooms in on the painting of the dead husband who they just decapitated oh That's, right who's watching them all do right. a round robin swing in sex party right. yeah there, there was two things the one was Holmes when he was just he felt like the dude Walked on the set and he was like, I'm going to get paid for my day. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. And he just seems so nonchalant. His character He's just like, come on, y'all, let's just all start fucking each other. Who cares? Like (laughs) all that. And it was some of the some of the funniest some of the funniest moments actually came from Holmes, which I I didn't see coming because he was uncredited in this, too. Like he didn't even get credit at the time. And sad, man. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure he was just like, get me paid and get me laid. But, you know. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah, and well, and clearly he went on to have a career, so he's, yeah, he's oh all, yeah, he's all good. 
He went into some crazy shit, like murders and stuff. We won't get into it, but my Whoa. god, yeah. He look it up. Look it up. He's got a dark, dark past. Or All I guess right. he's, he's well, dead now. That. But. Uh, well, we might enter the reductive rating round here on on Widow Blue. Uh, for for the first hard gore film that I watched, I'm gonna be giving it like a like a pretty decent three, I think. Yeah. Um, Just to ease yourself into this, baby. Uh, yeah, I is mean, that what it, you think? it's possible with further investigating the genre that possibly I could I could distinguish this as maybe a better film than it is. Because again, yeah. I will say that a, as far as like a low budget horror film goes, that they, they do put effort into the yeah. actual horror stuff, and he does make out. formal consideration mm-hmm. for why this is creepy and uneasy. Which is not what you would expect. Because, again, that was just it. Is we went into it being like, okay, this is going to be a porn movie with some horror scenes in it. And yeah. it was almost more like, no, this is a horror movie with porn scenes in it. Yeah. And that distinction Which was enough was to make me like for, it. But I didn't so, expect. So that was very cool. Yeah. And I, w- I would say that the <laughs> – Again, the the way that he kind of gets into that vulnerability uh, with the porn sequences and then how sudden and quickly it transitions into the violence and how the film basically never forgets the violence from there. Yeah. Again, the, the one sequence that still sits with me is the 69ing and three-way sequence where the film just gets weirdly – um, feverish and mm. and and really creepy, especially when there's a close up of her face going hard on this dude's dick, going hard, <laughs> yeah. and then it cuts to like a shot of the decapitated corpse or whatever. Yeah, and, and, it, and I it, think it's not even. And it's, it's not it's, even it's a hard fla- cut. No, it's flash cut. It's like, it's like <laughs> faded in too. I think at one point, yeah. So you see both images. You see the decapitation, mm. and then you see a a girl giving head to a guy. So it's like. You don't know how to feel. <laughs> no, what it foreshadows is literally the ending. Yeah. Which is definitely. a girl going down on a dick and then something getting decapitated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just a different head this time. Again, so th- the fact that there was that kind of thought and consideration put into the horror elements of this film was enough to get me to uh, end up liking Engage it, despite it. the fact that I don't know that I would watch it again or that I yeah. would watch another. Uh, I'm not sure how much this genre in particular interests me personally but i would love to explore it and see more that, yeah and kind of get an idea of what people were doing in it because again the fact that this is as as will has kind of laid out the history of it that this might have even this was pretty transgressive even for porn and horror at its time yeah, both yeah. um you know clearly walt davis was a bit of a forward thinker in that department and i guess i'm just not that familiar with his department <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i'm uh i'm gonna go with you pretty much the same I, right now it's a it's a three i do feel like uh, it, you know some of the ones that you mentioned will maybe we'll look into them uh, on our own time and, and see just kind of how they compare. He dares us. Okay, yeah. we got to do it now. Yeah, exactly. You know? So I'm, al- I'm also going to give it the, the three out of the five. Um, I thought that the constant balance between violence, uh, the violent horror, and the really good comedy stuff uh, was interesting, and it never it, it made me feel like I didn't know what to feel the whole time. Um, it, 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 it does the, the weird dream reality of it does make the more porn dialogue sounding stuff work better too yes, was one thing that absolutely. we didn't really get to bring up a whole lot but every time a dude like transitions from like okay I gotta continue the scene uh uh, I don't know. Why don't we pick up the coffin or like, yeah, <laughs> like that, like that stuff actually plays into the universe almost that he's, that he's formed. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm going to give it the three out of the five and, uh, I'm going to dive into maybe a couple more of these just to get a comparison. And I want to see if some I find funnier, maybe some are more violent. I don't know. So I'm excited about it. <laughs> and, uh, I, I little concerned. Hardcore next. I think hardcore would be your next. Hardcore. Hardcore. Is that uh, one one of the more like because you were mentioning some more violent ones? Is that yeah? I think hardcore you'll find a little more fun. Oh okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so for, for my rating for this, to some extent, I think uh, this movie almost trans transcends the rating system. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of more of an object or a fact than yeah. than uh, a. a, a than anything else, but I suppose I will also give it a three. I think three seems the fair grade for it. And uh, I guess my final thoughts about it would be, I think it's interesting to think that in 1970, remember there wasn't really a porn industry yet. Right. 
There were just these sort of renegade filmmakers. And a lot of them were sort of like either hippies or failed filmmakers, uh, <laughs> just people, you know, just people trying to either make ends meet or make a statement. And um, I think I think this is an example of how porn at the time wasn't that far removed from like underground film. You can definitely see, you know, that this isn't a million miles away from like John Waters or the Kuchar brothers or Andy Warhol, even the sorts of films they were making. All right. Well, I think that will wrap it up for Widow Blue uh, and the, shit, the Black Cat. Yeah. yeah. So both both films. Thanks so much, uh, Will, for coming on. And God damn it, someone is. There are people dying <laughs> if you here hear in London sirens, right now. We apologize, but there are Maybe people. They don't want us talking about. Yeah, it. that's like the fi- the fifth siren that's come by They're while we've been after recording us this after show. that combo about Blue Widow. Yeah, they Widow were, Blue. I did it. Widow damn Blue. It. Damn it. We are we are the so we are the porn cops. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're here <laughs> to have a sexy time. <laughs> Well, um, gentlemen, thanks for having me on, and thanks for watching Widow Blue and also The Black Cat. Oh, oh hell no, yeah. Thanks, not thanks everyone would. We're, and, and everyone who's listening, we hope that you guys go and check both of these films out because we had a, a lot of fun watching them. Yeah. Uh, Will, this is the part of the show where if you've got anything to plug, you can do it right here. Oh, absolutely. Well, I have two podcasts. There's The Important Cinema Club, which is about the history of film, and there's Michael and Us, which is about political cinema. So by all means, uh, download and, uh, and even give us money, please. <laughs> nice. We all appreciate it. Yes. Uh, listeners uh, out there, shit, uh, what, what are we doing? Hold on. T- uh, one week from now. <laughs> <laughs> we got it. We, we've already got this episode in the can, so I should know it. Uh, we are doing uh, The Exorcist. Yes. William Friedkin's The Exorcist, nineteen seventy three. Never uh, heard of it. Never heard of it. Yeah, bit the the some low budget, <laughs> non known film. You know. Yeah, Walt Davis level. You know, whatever. It's <laughs> fine. Um, but we just programmed it for our uh, Halloween retromania here in London at the Highland Theater. So Jamie killer. and I got to watch The Exorcist on thirty five millimeter uh, film yes. with the uh, DTS like sound the on 70s. and everything. It's and great. exactly, so we we felt like that movie had a profound uh, impact on the 200, 250 people that ended up, I think showing up to that. Yeah. Uh, and what an experience to hear that movie with that sound. Oh, it um, was so good. So that's what we're going to be talking about, uh, in, in one week alongside Mario Bava's shock. 1977 yeah. weird little film uh, another child possession film but this time time done by it's i believe it was also his last film before he died oh sure. uh, yeah Mario you're right. Bava. i did read that um a a very creepy child possession film uh honestly thematically similar to the black cat mm-hmm. about a the sort of repression of a past horror that kind of makes its way back into the domestic yeah. uh future family unit almost um but yeah two really creepy child possession films we're going to be tackling in one week's time Coming your way. Uh, you can find that on patreon.com slash lezoids podcast in one week uh but two weeks from now free listeners uh everywhere we're going to be talking, we're going to be going down the route of 50s horror. We, 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 we said that October was going to be Spooktober, but we're just... <laughs> it's we're, like November yeah, as we're, well. Yeah, we're well into November with that episode, and so... You know what? Fuck Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> we're going the oh, yeah, rest I've already, of the year. <laughs> yeah, just horror, I guess, all the time. But we, we're going to have a special guest on, and he is bringing with him uh, The Tingler. Ooh. 1959. Is that another porno? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it could be. <laughs> uh, and we're going to be uh, pairing it with Corridors of Blood. And these are two 50s horror movies that I haven't seen. I really like that name. That's just so like <laughs> metal. But both of them did place on our list, which we haven't talked about on the show at all. But we made a oh, horror list. Nice. Um, we made a horror list of uh, a bunch of basically we had all of you guys vote. We had about 700 or 800 total entries across the decades. Yeah. Yeah, it was huge. Uh, we started Very petering cool. out a little bit as we got into the the 50s. Yeah. Uh, so we unfortunately had to cut it off at the 50s, even though we could have done all the way to the 30s and 20s with horror. But uh, we just did the top 30 horror movies from the 2010s all the way to the 1950s, as voted by you guys. Yeah. And it's a damn good the list, Tingler I and I believe Corridors of Blood both made the 1950s list. Nice. And that's what this guest has chosen. So that's what we're going to be talking about uh, in two weeks' time uh, for everyone. So that'll wrap it up, I think, for this week's show. As always, uh, keep it sleazy. Keep it sleazy.